This week on the Lectures in History podcast, a discussion about the Cold War and the atomic apocalypse. University of Maryland professor Piotr Kosicki gives an overview of 20th century politics and describes religious beliefs of doomsday. So today we are back for lecture number 11. This is the Cold War and atomic apocalypse. Today we really complete a pivot that we began last week from thinking in terms of religiously framed stories of apocalypse to secular visions of the end of human history. Politics has followed us throughout this entire course, and it will continue to follow us through the rest of this last week of course content. But now we turn squarely also to the realm of science and technology, which we can imagine as a world apart from organized religion, although really you'll see they overlap substantially and fundamentally in ways that are crucial for understanding the takeaways from this course on apocalyptic thought. In our sessions a couple weeks ago on apocalypse in the European Renaissance or the Enlightenment eras, science took on the guise of natural philosophy, part and parcel of the Judeo-Christian worldview, which we've seen really shaping Western culture in the fundamental way. And we saw in the 1800s, especially, but not exclusively, through the writings of Charles Darwin and Karl Marx, natural philosophy transformed and metamorphosed into a secular set of notions of science that empowered human beings to put themselves increasingly in the role of gods, engineering machines to do their bidding. The trajectory we've covered this term involves moving from just trying to describe the world around us, the things of this world, into a project of figuring out the optimum rules for ordering the world, and then remaking the world according to those rules in order to master the world around us. In other words, following the assumption, which we've seen again and again and again, first in a religious caste and now in a secular caste, that a progressive view of history, understood as human history, means that human beings can perfect their own future. In other words, it's no longer up to God alone to define perfection as an end state in the afterlife in divine time or kairos, but that human beings can create heaven on earth, can set the terms and define the trajectory for the path to that most rational, perfect, secular eschaton. And in that case, an apocalypse doesn't require belief in a separate realm of divine time. It doesn't require belief in Kairos. We have only Kronos, the secular linear time of our own world, rather than divine intervention or the kind of heavenly Jerusalem imagined in the text that started it all for us in this course, John's book of Revelation, last book of the Christian Bible. Instead, we as human beings can engineer our own optimum end state, So goes the guiding principle of secular apocalyptic thinking since the 18th century, the so-called modern era in European history, spanning from the quote-unquote enlightened industrial ages onward into our present digital age. And uh, historians like to use the word modernity to talk about these centuries. Some historians will focus on the fact that the 21st century has moved us beyond modernity in so many ways. I'm not sure about that. I think that the thought processes we're tracing really still show us very similar trend lines to what we've been covering throughout the last weeks of the course. So we're very much still dwelling for the rest of the course content this week in a time period that I think we can call modern based on how human beings believe that they can engineer their own perfect world without needing to leave it behind and move on to a God-given place called capital H Heaven. Now, if you look at the title slide of today's lecture, you see a still from the film Dr. Strangelove, which I asked you all to watch for today. This film, made in 1964, came out at the height of the Cold War. and We'll talk about it at some length today. I hope you all watched it and got a good deal out of it because it's really an extraordinary film. Uh, One of the most famous films by the late great director Stanley Kubrick. What you see here in this title image is one of the major characters in the film, named Major Kong, actually riding a nuclear warhead, being launched to start World War III, uh, which more or less was understood to equate with global nuclear annihilation. And thinking in terms of nuclear catastrophe, what Cold War political scientists, particularly on the US side, 
referred to as mutually assured destruction, where there's one side in a conflict who has the power to completely annihilate the other side, but then again, the other side can respond by annihilating the first side. So the idea, fundamentally, when we talk about mutually assured destruction and the history of nuclear technology in the Cold War, is that rationally, neither side should launch those weapons first, what's called a first strike, because both sides know that would be game over for everybody. This movie, Dr. Strangelove, posits instead that rationality dropped out and the consequences were predictable and completely catastrophic. Now, this is an assumption that really has been guiding a lot of talk about the apocalypse, the coming of end of the world uh, stories in 2022 and now 2023. Some of it has to do with current world politics. Certainly U.S. politics play a role too. Right now, the top issue uh, seems to be the U.S. place in the world as understood through the lens, especially of President Biden's stance on Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. We saw the Ukrainian president uh, just before Christmas visiting Washington, D.C., Volodymyr Zelensky. So Ukraine remains, as does Russia, for its uh, steamrolling of sovereign Ukrainian soil and the really effective Ukrainian response to that full-scale invasion. It's not just about Russia and Ukraine, though. Uh, persistence of fears of nuclear apocalypse in our world. We could talk about North Korea, and indeed North Korea has been a serious part of the conversation about nuclear threats continually uh, for years since uh, it debuted its nuclear technology, or Iran, especially with the uh, US withdrawal a few years ago under then President Trump from the Iran nuclear deal, or the People's Republic of China, uh, certainly on the ascent and certainly in the headlines always, regardless of your uh, ideological convictions within U.S. politics. All of these have made for plenty of conversation among pundits in the past few years about just how realistic it is that we human beings will imminently meet our demise collectively beneath a mushroom cloud. But without even getting into contemporary politics, we can stop for a moment and think in terms of where, from the vantage point of Right now, in January 2023, we see ourselves in a trajectory that started with the development of nuclear technology in the 1940s in the context of the Allied effort in World War II. Now let's turn to our next slide. On the left, we have an image from the cover of Time magazine in 1990 of the great Soviet physicist and dissident Andrei Saharov. For those who haven't heard this word before, the word dissident means a civil objector, someone who is practicing civil disobedience without taking up arms or launching an armed rebellion. It's a word whose historical roots are often found in disobedience against the governments of the Soviet Union and its Cold War era puppet governments across Central and Eastern Europe. Though now the word has taken on much wider resonance. And we talk about quote unquote dissidents against dictatorships and authoritarian regimes everywhere of all ideological stripes. This man depicted here, Andrei Saharov, worked hard in the 1940s and 50s when Joseph Stalin was in power in the USSR to get the Soviet Union atomic and thermonuclear weapons technology, only then to do a complete about face, turning away from everything he had done as a younger man and becoming an international campaigner denouncing the Soviet Union's misuse of atomic technology and suppression of human rights and oppression of various categories of its citizens. In other words, Saharov went from being one of the engineers of the Soviet atomic arsenal toward being one of its greatest critics. And I need to be clear here, not just of the technology itself, but more generally of the Soviet Union's place in the world and something Saharov underscored repeatedly, the lack of moral authority uh, that the Soviet Union experienced, broadcast, in spite of the fact that it claimed to be the ultimate moral state in the world in the communist pursuit of total equality and justice. Uh, according to the theory originally taken from Karl Marx. Now, in 1975, Andrei Saharov won the Nobel Peace Prize. He wasn't allowed to come to receive it in person. So his wife came and delivered the Nobel Peace Prize lecture on his behalf. I'm going to quote that lecture at several points in this lecture today, 
And in front of you are two quotations on this slide, which speak, I think, already to some of the most important things to consider as we move through today's class. Let's connect Saharov first to the bigger trend lines we've been discussing so far in our course. If we take God off the table, so to speak, for a second, if we take the Judeo-Christian faiths off the table for a minute, whether or not we still can think in terms of a framework of progressive history, moving better and better in linear fashion toward a perfectible end state in our lives and in our world, whether or not, like the German philosopher whom we read in the first week of class, Karl Löwit, in his book Meaning in History, we attribute that kind of progressive approach to broader questions of secularization and the construction of narratives of history, thinking about the broader shape of how history unfolds, past to present to future, that we get from John's book of Revelation originally. What Saharov gives us, one way or another, is a basis for both applauding and critiquing, or even denouncing, the way that progress has been defined in the context of the rise of global mass technology, especially weapons of mass destruction in the 20th and 21st centuries. And that really is the key to this week's material in our course. What Sahabov had to say in 1975 was as follows. Here's the first quotation, you see it in front of you on this slide. Mankind at the threshold of the second half of the 20th century entered a particularly decisive and critical period of its history. And, second quotation, there is no doubt that industrial and technological progress is the most important factor in overcoming poverty, famine, and disease. But this progress leads at the same time to ominous changes in the environment in which we live and the exhaustion of our natural resources. In this way, mankind faces grave ecological dangers." End quote. So these are lines from Zaharov's 1975 Nobel Peace Prize lecture. And this was not simply a critique of environmental dangers or uh, the dangers of mass famine that Zaharov was launching. What he was saying is that humankind in the course of the 20th century had reached a point where all of a sudden it was transforming and reshaping every dimension of life on earth. Aspirationally would in fact be transforming the whole of the secular realm, the universe in quotes, if it could get that far, according to its own taste and its own plans. If we go back to the lecture a week ago about Isaac Newton, Voltaire, and apocalyptic thinking during the Enlightenment, you can jog your memories and maybe think about what Voltaire was saying. Saharov seems to confirm Voltaire's prophecy from 200 years earlier about humankind being able to build what historian Karl Becker described as the heavenly city of the 18th century philosophers of the Enlightenment. But if we read closely and if we think closely about Saharov's words, we realize there's also a caution, a warning, unlike the unbridled belief in rational progress that we saw in Voltaire. Saharov says there's no doubt that we've achieved industrial and technological progress. And this is crucial to improving the day-to-day -day lives of human beings. Whether we're talking about thinkers on the US side of the Cold War or the Soviet side of the Cold War, uh, we can understand that this idea of progress, wanting to improve or at least declaring a desire to improve the day-to-day -day lives of human beings uh, to aid in relieving material privation, whether for the industrial workers of uh, Europe and uh, the Americas or the uh, resource imbalances in the regions of the world emerging from European decolonization. Saharov was looking at the global south, the global north, as a, a, a world, an integrated world, where disease and famine needed to be overcome and technology was necessary for that. But humankind in pursuing this technology, frankly, had become too big for its britches. And frankly, we have passed the point where we can anticipate the consequences of our collective actions. This was Saharov's thinking, and I want to underline it because it's a key part of how I want you to understand the uh, last 50 to 70 years worth of material that we're covering in this course. We can say that we've given up on caring about the consequences, something, uh, 
for example, we see quite regularly in the 21st century in the ebb and flow, the back and forth of policy decision-making about environmental regulations. Uh, for example, in the U.S. Supreme Court rulings in 2022, or the long-standing selling off of the Amazon rainforest in Brazil, right now, the threat is global. And I think we can be forgiven, if not entirely uh, supported in our concern for the future of what progress means and what exactly progress is going to yield for humankind collectively in the end. So how do I saw all this coming already 50 years ago in the mid 1970s? More generally, what we find is that humankind cannot, or at least has not been able to keep up with the broader balance, uh, achieve some kind of equilibrium relative to the longer term issues of progressive history. In other words, unless we assume that we're living in the end times right now, pretty daunting assumption, then there's still a future ahead of us. There's still a trajectory to be pursued in progressive history, if we choose to see history that way, as uh, an unfolding, continuing process leading toward better and better end states. Sadov's point is that we haven't reached that final end point at all. There's still clearly so much more to do. Now, even if we were to buy completely into the general plan laid out by Enlightenment thinkers about humankind's ability to use reason to keep improving the world around us, then we should continue to see things like Saharov did, more and more work ahead of us. To be frank, though, you know, why should we give that much credit to Diderot or to Voltaire on the score of human perfectibility when we see so much injustice, human perfidy, even genocide still ongoing today in our world of 2023? The conversation we're having today, I've mentioned, is a departure in many ways from John of Patmos's book of Revelation, the biblical apocalypse with which we began this course. And yet, please keep in the backs of your minds a quotation I raised at the very beginning of lecture yesterday from Nazi-era German legal theorist Carl Schmitt, commenting, among others, precisely on John's book of Revelation. I quote, you can see it on the slide, all significant concepts of modern politics are secularized theological concepts, end quote. In other words, even if we're talking about issues that seem to be exclusively secular, in the background, conceptually, or as an underlying layer, in the elect intellectual foregrounding, lurk religious ideas and their forms that have come down to us in the way that we read from Karl Lovett, for example, in his book, Meaning in History, that we've read for this course, through centuries and millennia of the Judeo-Christian worldview. Now, you don't have to buy in hook, line, and sinker into either Lewitz or Schmidt's points about how those concepts from theology have been secularized. And obviously, that's okay. But what I want you to take away from this course, among other things, is the fact that these things are connected. In talking about an apocalypse or conceiving of the possibility of an atomic apocalypse, we're not just appropriating, maybe misusing, the word derived from the Greek, about stories that foretell our collective doom or stories of meaning found through progress in history. That's after all, the textbook definition of apocalypse as we've been using it since the start of this course. And you should have that clearly set in your minds if you wanna do well on the final exam on Monday. But more than just revisiting key definitions, studying apocalypse involves making sense of a range of narratives about the coming of the end of history, the end times, which become progressively more and more human more and more secular, and put progressively more and more power into the hands of human beings themselves, as opposed to wrestling within the framework, exclusively within the framework of a divine entity, the Judeo-Christian God. This is why we'll pay attention this week to the destructive potential, historically, empirically, certain certainly during World War II, but not exclusively of atomic weaponry, and why for tomorrow, for example, we'll watch the film The Matrix and think also about the long-term dangers of how society is transformed in a way that automates the relationships between human beings. This is something that the hegemonic takeover of civil discourse in the 21st century by online social media has accelerated in a way that I think very few commentators can really keep up and feel like they have a grasp of 
all the dynamics of how we interface as human beings with each other or less and less so. Certainly the next generation, maybe not just, maybe not even your generation, but the next couple will follow you, say someone 15 to 20 years younger than you, how on earth are they going to learn to interface with each other as human beings in a world that is so determined by consumption of technology in which so much of our contact with the world is mediated by tech? And I realize, of course, I'm not saying anything new here, but it is something worth restating again and again and considering in the context of a long-term trajectory of apocalyptic thinking, that social media and how we become disconnected from one another and how we mediate human contact through technology and through uh, impersonal third-party realms, that changes us. And that changes our own understanding of what comes next and what we're seeking collectively. Then at the bottom of this slide, what we discussed on Friday, even if you don't call it eugenics, the ongoing project and belief in the perfectibility of humankind and of humankind's ability to remove flaws within our own species and replace negative traits with positive traits or to cut out negative traits. It sounds innocent enough, but in fact, it was part and parcel of the National Socialist, the Nazi projects of forcible sterilization and mass murder of targets whom they described as not worthy of passing on their genes. Even if we're not sterilizing so-called undesirable populations, even if we're not preventing the reproduction of groups, certain groups within our human population, we're still talking about an attempt to engineer better human beings uh, when we talk about genetic engineering. And that itself exposes an unfolding danger disrupting the evolution of our species. But let's turn back to Saharov here for a second. Was he saying that science is too dangerous to remain at the very center of our lives? And how, how are we supposed to feel about that, given how science obviously dictates so much of our daily realities? And we saw this in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Couldn't have been possibly clearer, uh, both in practical terms of how food and other uh, consumer goods were delivered to us by Amazon or other delivery services, and in terms of how we ultimately sought out vaccines that would let us re-enter the world. And how do you feel more generally about stepping back and questioning the role of science? Well, let's read what Saharov had to say in his 1975 Nobel lecture about this. We cannot reject the idea of a more and more widespread use of the results of medical research or the extension of research in all of its branches, including bacteriology and virology, neurophysiology, human genetics, and gene surgery. Here's the key part. No matter what potential dangers lurk in their abuse and the undesirable social consequences of this research." End quote. Now, Sahadov was a nuclear physicist. At heart, he was a rational believer in the power of secular science, and the power in particular of secular science to improve mankind. He had been a willing participant in the political projects of the Soviet Union and its leadership's attempt to make their country the global scientific powerhouse. True, Saharov had become disillusioned by his role in the weaponization of the Soviet state. But that didn't mean that he didn't believe that humankind had the power to use reason and philosophy to master the world, that science could still hold the key. So then, the question that I would pose to you would have to be, how far is too far? You saw in yesterday's lecture what the destructive eliminationist potential of eugenics could mean, how it translated into Nazi Germany's approach to destroying entire swaths of the German population, to racializing mental and physical disability, to trying to identify a genetic code and attributing, we saw this in uh, Friday's lecture, even aspects of that genetic code to religious communities and national communities to various peoples and above all to Europe's Jewish community. So at the end of the day, it's a question that remains open here and will remain open throughout this final week of the course. Is science too dangerous as a vehicle for promoting progress in human history? In other words, if God is brushed to the side, if theological concepts are fully secularized in the pursuit of political and technological advancement, does that necessarily spell disaster 
and this is something, I'll say another word in a moment about this, does that spell the kind of disaster, part ecological, part anthropological, that we see playing out in that short story? Very short, but so powerful and compelling from 1950 that I asked you to read for today by a legendary literary figure, Ray Bradbury, called Soft Rains. As I mentioned, even though we've moved away from religious belief, it is always in the background. Think back and keep the medieval mystic Joachim of Fiore pictured here in the backs of your minds as we consider the extent to which the narratives we're exploring in class today really may or may not derive in some way, or at least to some extent, from the kind of progressive notion of history which Joachim pioneered for his idea of the Third Age, of the post-Christian age, and which 500 years after Joachim's death, the Enlightenment philosophers began secularizing in full earnest. Think back here again to the book we read, Meaning in History, by Karl Löwit. The anti-Nazi philosopher Löwit, writing after World War II based on his exploration of the apocalyptic writings of Joachim of Fiore, concluded, you can see the quotation here, the mere fact that Christianity interprets itself as a new testament, superseding an old one and fulfilling the promises of the latter, necessarily invites further progress and innovations, either religious or irreligious and anti-religious. Hence the derivation of the secular irreligions of progress from the eschatology of the church, together with their theological pattern. In other words, by the end of lecture today, you should ask yourselves, keeping in mind Leuvet's words, this question. Is the atomic apocalypse, is the threat of global nuclear annihilation the product of a secular irreligion of progress? And if so, can we translate it? Can we derive that? from the general trajectory, the broad historical pattern that we've traced so far in this course, from Judeo-Christian eschatology to a Euro-American secular faith and boundless progress that we make for ourselves. As you think about this, I wanted to encourage you to keep in mind specifically again that one key word, progress. Again, I'm quoting from Soviet physicist Andrei Sahadov's 1975 Nobel lecture. Progress is indispensable, and to bring it to a halt would involve the decline and fall of our civilization. Very Joachite, this speech, and also very wedded to an enlightenment narrative of humankind's ability to build our own rational, secular end state of perfection on earth. Next quotation, in actual fact, all important aspects of progress are closely interwoven. Not one of them can be dispensed with without a risk of destroying the entire setup of civilization. Progress is indivisible. And Saharov went on, progress is possible and innocuous only when it is a subject to the control of reason. End quote. Hitler's idea of progress, and Hitler did clearly have an idea of progress, we saw this when we discussed Hitler at length in last week's material. In Saharov's eyes, that was a perverse mockery of the Enlightenment ideal. But in some sense, this is in the eye of the beholder. Hitler, as you read in the table talks, believed that he had followed and was following, still, even in 1945, just prior to his suicide, a rational framework of progress. For the Aryans, at least, as he saw them, what was tantamount to genocide, to the capital H Holocaust of the Europe's Jewish population, to eugenics, to total war, and ultimately turned, proved to be a catastrophe for Germany, in addition to the catastrophic death tolls and scale of genocide, to Hitler seemed rational. In any case, he surely would not have admitted to or seen himself as being beyond the control of reason, as Saharov would think about those terms. And in fact, Hitler could have fallen back, among others, on his 19th century icon, Friedrich Nietzsche, and that quotation you've now read several times this course from Nietzsche's 1882 book, The Gay Science. Shall we not ourselves have to become gods merely to seem worthy of it? There never was a greater event, and on account of it, all who were born after us belong to a higher history than any history so far, end quote. In other words, that the death of God and the death of organized religion flips the eschaton in a way that really empowers science and empowers scientists specifically 
to become a new breed of gods for humankind and for human civilization. Now that's something we really see in the topics we're tackling this week. I return here for a moment to a quotation from my University of Maryland colleague, Vladimir Tismanyanu, from whom you read for yesterday's class, because for the rest of this lecture, we're going to be dealing squarely with the historical context of the Cold War and the atomic age that it ushered in for the second half of the 20th century. Remember from yesterday's lecture, we were talking about class warfare. And I quoted from Tismanyanu's book, The Devil in History, a passage that I had assigned you to read. Quote, when I demand justice, I seem to be asking for hate, end quote. This is a broader judgment, though, that Tismanyanu pronounces on totalitarianism and how, once in power, almost any once beautiful sounding ideal could turn into a way of exercising and mastering total control over other people and persecuting and killing many of them. It's also a product of seeing in that secular flipping of the eschaton that we've been talking about in the past week's worth of material of our course. The belief that humankind writes its own final judgment and builds its own perfectible end times, that frequently the design goes off the rails, cannot be, in fact, believed to follow its future along that linear path, because at the end of the day, human beings just aren't perfect. And as such, we cannot be trusted to achieve a perfectible, consistent goal. Obviously, one of the key examples, I've already mentioned that this is what Tismanyanu had in mind with that particular quotation, uh, in modern history is what by all accounts was a certain beautiful utopian vision propounded by Karl Marx. You heard about this at length last week, Marx's proposal that the old socialist idea of shared ownership of the means of production being especially concentrated in the hands of industrial workers, so men and women working with their hands and suffering because of that work. You see in the lower right hand corner of the slide, the reorientation of life around the assembly line in the modern world. Well, the Russian revolutionaries known as the Bolsheviks, when they took power in Russia in the fall of 1917, really took Marx's message to heart, seeking to build a utopian end goal, to bring to bear in this world the secular eschaton of the classless society in a way that would flip justice and as Tismanyanu put it, frequently redefined justice to look like we at a glance might instead call hate. Insofar as the Bolsheviks were replacing gods in organized religion, since after all Marx had demanded a commitment to scientific atheism among others, organized religion is out, either co-opted and manipulated by the state or made illegal and pushed underground. And as a replacement, we have a new narrative of salvation, a secular, anti-metaphysical, anti-transcendent narrative of heaven on earth. As Tismanyanu put it, communism was a story of purity and regeneration that motivated fanatical commitment to the still promising future and a visceral opposition to the real or imagined squalor of the old dying order." End quote. That old dying order was seen to be the past or present with progressive history at the core of the movement here on earth. Now, obviously, I'm retracing some ground that we've already explored, but I'm doing so because I want to bring together for you the different ingredients that mix together to produce the atomic age. You don't get the atomic age without the communist side of the equation. There is an American side. There is a Soviet side. The original context for the American development of atomic weapons technology came in the World War II era fight against Nazi Germany. But the full on development of an atomically driven civilization a civilization on the brink of being destroyed by nuclear annihilation on a global scale, that resulted from the clash between American-style capitalism and Soviet-style communism. So the narrative from the Soviet side is essential to keep in mind as a continuation of what we have studied so far throughout this course. It's not just about the idea. It's not just about what Carl Schmitt would have called secularized theological concepts that went into building the politics of the Soviet Union. It's about trusting that there was a certain path to humankind's salvation and having that vision of the path to salvation confront another vision, the US based vision that really became so powerful globally after the Second World War. By November 1917, the Bolsheviks 
had conducted their own bloody revolution and really dealt a coup de grace to the parliamentary revolution in Russia of February 1917 that initially replaced the imperial government. It took half a decade of bloody and brutal civil war until 1922 to formally institute the country called the Soviet Union. And barely two years after that, Joseph Stalin would consolidate power and hold it for three decades until his death in 1953. Stalin was taking on the role, what Tismaniano has called, the eschatological agent. In other words, the supposed bringer, or the self-proclaimed intended bringer, of the end times, of, in this case, a perfect classless society. And we saw the masses of victims in yesterday's lecture that resulted, spanning agricultural collectivization, forcible industrialization, bringing famine with millions dead in Ukraine and Kazakhstan in the early to mid-1930s, brought over a million dead in the Great Terror Campaign that was waged throughout the Soviet Union in the second half of the 1930s, decimating Soviet society, especially its upper echelons. And it also created something that we discussed on Friday, this idea of the heritability of class identity. In other words, that you had passed down to you from your parents or your grandparents' generations, whatever negative traits, the Bolsheviks like to call these counter-revolutionary or reactionary traits, that those generations were considered by the Soviet political authorities to have held. So where does that bring us in terms of the context for today's lecture? Well, the Soviet Union was, to put it very mildly, not a friendly place to live. By the start of World War II already, Joseph Stalin had been conducting mass purges, leading to the deaths of millions, range of different methods, some cases famine, others arrest, torture, and execution, in other cases mass deportation, a whole wide spectrum of practices. This is the country that would ultimately come to compete with the United States for control over atomic technology beginning in the 1940s. And that competition would then define the next half century and arguably actually still defines the global order to this day. Something that we see even though Barack Obama won a Nobel Peace Prize in his first months as president in 2009 for supposedly being responsible for the imminent dismantling of the nuclear arsenals of the US and Russia. More than a decade on, we see that in fact things have gotten so much worse with the Russian full-scale invasion of sovereign Ukrainian territory in February 2022 leading, among others, to constant fears that Russian President Vladimir Putin could be on the verge of launching Russian nukes and triggering global Armageddon. Already in 2017, the doomsday clock, when the key topics we're discussing today, inched closer to what its architects call midnight, which represents the expected moment of humanity's extinction. In January 2022, we were supposedly 100 seconds to midnight, the same as one year before that. And that's the closest that we've ever been to our own collective demise. At the start of 2017, the clock had advanced half a minute from three minutes to two and a half minutes. And it does not look to be pulling back anytime soon. There are a range of explanations, but at the top of the list are climate change and the declining trends within the US-Russia relationship. The doomsday clock setting for this year is actually going to be announced in the coming days. And I think it's a safe bet that given Putin's crimes in Ukraine and his ongoing nuclear saber rattling, the doomsday clock will be moved even closer to the end. So the origins of all this, if we go back to the 1940s, really come in the reluctant foraging of an allied partnership during World War II. And I say reluctant because, remember, in August of 1939, Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union had in fact concluded an alliance with one another, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. It's not until Hitler broke that alliance in June of 1941 and invaded the Soviet Union, reviving the long-standing antagonism that the Nazis had shown toward communists, that the Soviet Union, under the leadership of Joseph Stalin, pictured here on the right, was driven into the arms of Winston Churchill's Britain. Churchill is here on the left, and in the middle, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, President of the United States. Theirs was the Allied partnership with many other countries involved as well, but these being the quote-unquote big three, the real decision makers of the war's final years. At the February 1945 Yalta meeting pictured here, uh, 
I should add, by the way, that Yalta on the Crimean Peninsula in the Soviet Union. Uh, location was chosen, among other reasons. Little known fact, Joseph Stalin was afraid to fly. So wherever possible, he tried to bring his allied partners to places that were within striking distance for him. We could get ideally by ground transportation. Now, this particular meeting was not an auspicious meeting for the other countries. Churchill was very much involved in the deal making at Yalta, sort of thinking through the lens of British domestic politics above all, uh, with an upcoming election to fight. And in the end, he would actually lose that election, the first election to be held after the Second World War, despite having led the United Kingdom really successfully throughout the war. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt was not long for the world as of February 1945. Within two months, he would be dead following a massive stroke, and he would be replaced as president of the United States by Harry Truman. So really Yalta, as the consensus of historians understands, was the playing field above all of Joseph Stalin. And it's at Yalta that the Allied leaders, with Stalin really calling the shots and Roosevelt not putting up much resistance, and Churchill having other things on his mind, that Stalin provided for what would become a durable division of Europe, and more generally of global political interests in the world, between the US-dominated, US-influenced blue half here on the western side, and the communist-dominated, Soviet-influenced red half in the east. Now, if you want to see the specific countries that were involved in these divisions, or that were the object of these divisions, you have a few examples here. The crucial examples for the creation of the so-called Soviet bloc after World War II were Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria. East Germany, that's a special case, arguably the defining special case of the entire Cold War. I don't have time to go into all the details here, but Germany was a divided country throughout this, the, the entirety of the Cold War. And within the divided country, if you look at the little dot of gray inside East Germany, was a divided city of Berlin. West Berlin was a little enclave of West Germany that was contained within, as you can see here, the territory of East Germany. And East Germany simply means what was left over after, in 1949, the communists refused to reunite their post-war occupation zone of Germany with the zones of Germany occupied by American, British, and French troops. The German zones were linking back together to create an independent capitalist federal republic of Germany. So East Germany would create a communist country under the thumb of the Soviet Union instead. These countries would pay lip service to the pursuit of Karl Marx's inspired ideology of communism, the rhetoric and the general philosophy of history. And I use the term advisedly, thinking through one of these secular eschatologies we've been exploring throughout the past week, the move toward a classless society. In the day to day, especially in the late 1940s and early 1950s, the new Soviet backed communist regimes in power behind the Iron Curtain borrowed some of the most perverse and destructive practices of the Soviet Union, particularly when it came to the destruction of human life. Show trials, the punishment of even good faith communists who had played a role in leading the newly communist countries, but who then became scapegoats as new leaders started gunning for each other and jockeying for power and trying to claim who was most like Stalin and who was doing best at advancing the revolution. The rapid industrialization plans, five-year plans, to borrow a term, again pioneered by Stalin in the 1920s and 30s in the Soviet Union. Worst of all, the secret police, the individuals who would be interrogating, torturing, killing in brutal ways, and above all, enforcing an ideological discipline and a system of terror. So if this, what we just described, represents a move to a secular eschaton, enforced by means of mass terror, something we saw, for example, in the middle of the French Revolution. If we consider the French Revolution, again, to have followed the blueprints of Jean-Jacques Rousseau and other Enlightenment philosophers, reflecting a rational mastery and understanding of humankind, then this is a grim and brutal way to redefine the secular order. Ironically, a brutality that didn't seem to have any end in sight hardly a picture of a perfect and progressive human end state. Now, in March of 1953, Stalin died. 
Stalinism, the system of government ideology that he had spawned within the Soviet orbit, spanning half a dozen countries' borders by the time of his death in 1953, survived the man himself. Germany would remain divided until 1990. The European continent would also remain divided. And Stalin's successor, depicted here, Nikita Khrushchev, proved to be a man of political contradictions. On the one hand, he denounced Stalin at the 20th Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, held in February 1956, you see it depicted here, calling Stalin a political criminal who betrayed the communist vision of the future, working against the classless society, against communism itself, by wrongly indicting loyal communist activists and wrongly rounding up millions of people and sending them to the gulag, labor camps and penal colonies, executing hundreds of thousands of others. But it was Stalin individually who was blamed not communism as a whole, and certainly not the secular eschaton lying at the heart of the whole Soviet project. Khrushchev doubled down, actually, when it came to a geopolitical conflict with the United States that had emerged over 15 years earlier, in the final months of World War II, with the beginning of what was called the Cold War. The war was called cold because it would involve the constant risk of turning to full-blown war, without actually bringing those ultimate catastrophic consequences. And you'll see in a minute this metaphor of cold and hot, cold being a sort of frozen phase of war, to borrow a keyword from earlier in this course, imminent with an A, always already in progress. Here, already, all around us, but not fulfilled, as opposed to the hot war, imminent with an I. So you see the eschatological language actually has a, a clear role to play in thinking conceptually through the way the Cold War played itself out in history. The main ideas underlining the Cold War translate very well into our story of apocalypse. Rewind to August of 1961. If you haven't taken any courses in 20th century history, you may not know this, that within the country of East Germany, there was the divided city of Berlin. In other words, to get from West Germany to the non-contiguous territory that it controlled of West Berlin, you either had to fly or basically take a sealed train. It was extremely complicated and extremely arduous, logistically speaking. But early on, at least, getting from East Berlin to West Berlin was actually not that hard, which is how East Berlin and East Germany more generally experienced a tremendous brain drain, especially for younger generations of talented people who felt like they were seeing their lives begin to rot and waste away behind the emerging Iron Curtain. So this torrential outward migration was stemmed beginning in August of 1961, when Nikita Khrushchev, head of the Soviet Union after Stalin's death, and his East German counterpart, whom you see here on the right-hand side of the upper portion of this slide, Walter Ubricht, worked together to start building the Berlin Wall. And this was maybe the most direct image flying in the face of the idea that the communists were pursuing and successfully building a secular eschaton, a global advertisement for how the USSR and its satellites were moving in the wrong direction. Instead of a classless society emerging, we have physical walls dividing different parts of humanity off from one another. Just over a year later, October 1962, there's the Cuban Missile Crisis when the USSR's placement of missiles in Cuba, newly communist Cuba, matched by the US placement of missiles in Turkey, a NATO country like the United States, but nonetheless perceived as being dangerously close to the USSR. The result was a 13-day crisis in October of 1962, where fear of nuclear war gripped centers of power on both sides of the Atlantic. You see at the bottom of this slide, and by the way, this telephone never actually existed, the proverbial red telephone, symbolizing the hotline between the Kremlin and Moscow and the White House in Washington, D.C. That was an active line of communication between U.S. President John F. Kennedy and Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev. In the end, it was Khrushchev who quote-unquote blinked. Kennedy saved face, and the Soviet Union's eschatology seemed to recede ever further into the distance. Now we'll get to what exactly it was that created such a risk 
and made the Cold War so importantly cold, so meaningfully cold, rather than face the devastating, destructive potential of the alternative hot scenario. That alternative scenario, as I've spelled out several times already in this lecture, was nuclear annihilation. Already in the context of World War II, after the United States entered the war in December 1941, following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, the U.S. launched a program known as the Manhattan Project, featuring some of the world's finest physicists and engineers working together in New Mexico to work on the creation of a new master weapon that would, if necessary, give the United States the ability to deal a final blow in the war, believed to be necessary in part because of intelligence that German scientists were also at work on an atomic weapon. In fact, some of these German scientists would later be absorbed by the U.S. defense establishment after World War II. The idea being that the Nazis had been defeated, and now the Soviets were the threat in terms of advancing weapons technology in the atomic age. The movie Dr. Strangelove offers a telling illustration of this pivot from foe to friend made by many German atomic scientists. The name of the movie's title character, played by Peter Sellers, is, after all, Dr. Strangelove. It's an anglicization of what's supposed to be a German name, Merkwürdige Liebe, and he is made to be emblematic of ex-Nazi scientists who played a role in the American defense and policy establishments during the Cold War, distinctly showing how even though atomic weapons technology had really emerged over and against Nazi Germany, it would actually ultimately take advantage of the skill set of formerly German, formerly Nazi even, scientists. Back to the origins of the U.S. Atomic Weapons Program. The leader of the Manhattan Project was University of California, Berkeley physics professor J. Robert Oppenheimer. What you see here at the bottom of the slide is the team of physicists who worked at Los Alamos Laboratory in New Mexico. They're depicted with the cyclotron where so many of their experiments were performed. And the result, in July 1945, just one month before the dropping of actual atomic bombs by the United States on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, what was called the Trinity Test in the desert in New Mexico, the first ever actual field test for atomic weapons technology in the history of the world, and really the beginning of the nuclear age. At this point in World War II, with Germany having surrendered, but with victory in Japan still proving elusive as August 1945 began, U.S. President Harry Truman, who until recently had had no earthly idea that the Manhattan Project even existed, gave the order for a special elite squadron of bombers, headed up by the plane you see up at the top of this slide here, the Enola Gay, to fly the bomb at the bottom of this slide, labeled the Little Boy, the first atomic weapon that would be deployed in active warfare in human history. So on August 6, 1945, the Japanese city of Hiroshima was bombed, approximately 140,000 dead. Three days later, following the Japanese failure to surrender after the Hiroshima bombing, the Japanese city of Nagasaki is bombed, up to 80,000 dead. The numbers vary a bit depending on the exact time frame that we consider, given the long-term effects of radiation exposure. I'm giving you roughly maximum numbers here. This is a picture of Hiroshima right after the bombing. You can see total devastation, a literal physical disembowelment of the space. By the way, this is the kind of image that you should have in mind when you finish reading Ray Bradbury's short story, Soft Rains. Thinking about rubble, we're thinking about a lone structure surviving, but also a proliferation of fire, and fire being delivered, for example, through rain, that kind of extraordinary paradox, black rain delivering nuclear pollution, radioactivity, and ultimately the ability to turn nature itself into poison. So the atomic race began in earnest as soon as the first bombs were dropped. Joseph Stalin, as leader of the Soviet Union, even before the US bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki, really had given the order to begin work in earnest on a Soviet counterpart. It took four years for the Soviet Union to get its own atomic bombs, but then it only took another four years for the Soviet Union to get a much more powerful version, thermonuclear weaponry, known as the hydrogen bomb. The hydrogen bomb was actually the project on which the physicist I mentioned and quoted several times already in this lecture, Andrei Saharov, future Nobel Peace Prize winner, played a crucial role in helping the USSR. 
helping, in fact, to guide the Soviet Union to that technology. Now, let's step back for a moment. By the time that the Soviet Union had acquired first atomic technology in 1949 and then hydrogen bomb technology in 1953, already for several years, the International English Language Journal of Physicists, Chemists, and other natural scientists devoted to work on atomic science, the so-called Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, appeared from 1945 onward. Worried about the technology that they had helped to unleash on the world and its catastrophic potential, these scientists launched and advertised an imaginary measuring device that they called the Doomsday Clock. Now, this isn't an actual physical clock, but rather a thought experiment, a product of international scientific collaboration and debate among the global community of scientists involved in atomic work. And this is a creation that has really lasted and been, for the most part, annually reset its resettings publicly announced since 1947 through the present day. You see here depicted the announcement from the year 2021. If you look at the graph on the slide in front of you, you see the full set of trends in terms of how close the atomic scientists responsible for the doomsday clock believe humankind has been at various points since 1947 to what they call midnight. In other words, humankind's annihilation. To be clear, the doomsday clock is no longer just about the likelihood of atomic warfare, but has now long considered also climate change, epidemiology, and other calamities faced by and or manufactured by humanity. Now, please keep in mind that this is all, of course, subjective. Even the scientists who deliberate and collectively reset the clock every year have their own political and ideological agendas. It's not to say that we shouldn't take very, very seriously their protect, predictions and their assessments. But there's also a grain of salt that you have to take as well when you're reading and trying to translate these settings into how you look at the world around you. Don't make it seem like it's a foregone conclusion that we're all going to die in a nuclear holocaust in the coming days. Knock on wood. But do be critical as we're looking at this data at the same time. The Domesday Clock considered that 1991 had been the safest moment in world history since the measurements and assessments started in 1947. On the other hand, the most dangerous moments that we've seen include, for example, 1953, just a few moments after the U.S. detonated the world's first thermonuclear weapon in November 1952, when the clock was set to two minutes to midnight. Then 2018, once again, two minutes to midnight. And then, since 2020, steady at 100 seconds to midnight, the most ominous setting in the history of the clock. How extraordinary and how terrifying that the experts consulted for the doomsday clock believe that we are presently the closest that we have ever been, 100 seconds to midnight on the doomsday clock to the end of human history. Now, in part, this had to do with the atomic scientist's allergy to now former U.S. President Donald Trump. In part, it also has to do with an assessment of the dramatic long-term failure of a number of initiatives that seemed a foregone conclusion after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War in 1991. Maybe you can already see where I'm going with this. If the start of atomic weaponry and the launching of the Cold War that involved the continuous imminent with an A potential for mutual destruction, which on a rational basis meant that supposedly no one was going to use the weapons and no one would invite the other side to annihilate it by launching weapons of its own accord. Then with that system gone, humankind in principle should have been able to move beyond the risks of total annihilation. For a while, it seemed like maybe it would, but you can see that basically there's been a steady return closer and closer to midnight since 1991, since the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War. The clock operates on the assumption that if mankind is not getting better, it's getting worse. This is incorporating 9-11, it's incorporating the rise of global terrorism, it's incorporating the resumed and renewed aggressiveness in the international system of Russia, the People's Republic of China, and various other global actors. And of course, it takes into account the recent COVID-19 pandemic and the systemic failures and inequalities that the pandemic exposed and how we think globally about what it means to be human and to live in solidarity 
or not with others elsewhere in the world. The Bulletin of Atomic Scientists Board has a whole list of reasons, which you saw in the reading I assigned you for today about the doomsday clock, to explain its criteria for moving the clock one way or the other. Every time this announcement is made, there's a big press conference with the version of the scene you see on this slide, and an actual hand on the clock that's adjusted one way or the other. This is how we can understand, for example, the maybe not so funny cartoon you see at the bottom of the slide here, where someone says, oh, hey, spring forward, it's daylight savings time, and in so doing accidentally brings about nuclear annihilation. But let's go back for a second and consider what the word doomsday actually means. Doomsday is a long-standing interpretation in English language cultures of the apocalypse of John of Patmos. The idea being that doomsday could be used as a synonym for judgment day, a synonym for the final second coming of Christ, the parousia, if you think back to the vocabulary we used in the first couple of days of this course. As such, it's a term that really came into common English language usage already almost a thousand years ago, when the invading Norman Duke, subsequent King of England, William the Conqueror in 1086 decided that, for the purposes of knowing exactly what the state of his new founded, newly enlarged kingdom would be at the moment when the world would end, when Kronos would turn into Kairos and Jesus would come down to earth. If you think back to the beginning of this course, this was a time period when everyone assumed, not just assumed, but really was eagerly and unapologetically, even desperately, awaiting the arrival of Jesus on earth and the arrival of the judgment in heaven. What they were seeking was conclusion to the misery of life on earth. Now, William wanted to know what the forces were on which he could count for the purposes, for example, of the final battle at Armageddon, otherwise known as Armageddon, between the forces of God and the forces of Satan. Today, we would call the Domesday Book a census, and you can see sample entries from the bottom of the slide. King William the Conqueror of England actually commissioned the Domesday or Domesday Book in 1086, which provided a comprehensive record of the possessions in the kingdom of which he had taken control. The entries in the Domesday Book were without appeal, a royal last judgment, following the notion of a day of final judgment in John's book of Revelation. So the vocabulary really fits together, both in terms of the apocalyptic and the political. So that idea of doomsday is really not all that new. And the connotations may have changed, something you've seen again and again in this course. Early on in this course, you may have been surprised to find that actually, the idea was to try to make the end times come as soon as possible, because the secular was seen as something negative. Only with the coming of the Enlightenment was this assumption stood on its head, as builders of heaven on earth became progressively more interested in staying on a perfected earth rather than leaving earthly existence behind once and for all. Even the Puritans, who had aspired to make the secular world run as much as possible according to God's principles rather than secular principles, to make a kind of heavenly Jerusalem on earth, at the end of the day, still wanted to be in the real, divine, heavenly Jerusalem and not here. But since the Enlightenment, the turn has been pretty definitive to seeing doomsday not as a good thing, not as something to be accelerated, to be made imminent with an eye right around the corner, but instead to be pushed off, to be at best considered imminent with an A. But at the end of the day, imminent in a way human beings themselves would be responsible for setting the terms of the eschaton's coming and for defining the way in which human history would be written as an apocalypse, not as an end to all of history in the sense of death, in the sense of the erasure of the world, the annihilation of the world, but in the sense of the arrival at the culmination of human history, the best, most accomplished, most rational, most perfect form that human history could take. Well, but what if as of the second half of the 20th century, we flip that definition once again. If you go back to that old idea of 1,000 or 2,000 years earlier, the Judeo-Christian notion of doomsday being a good thing, of being predicated specifically on the physical erasure, annihilation of the secular realm. That's not what most people want today. I certainly don't want that. I imagine that many of you don't want that either. But by the same token, when we talk about doomsday, there's a basic question to be posed. Do we assume that doomsday is a bad thing? 
do we assume that we should be actively doing everything in our power to prevent the coming of doomsday? And if so, how do we separate these two different, very distinct but intertwined notions of the end times from one another? End times can mean on the one hand that we, as a collective human community, are kaput, erased, annihilated, gone, and moving to a higher plane, or not. Or instead, end times could spell the fulfillment of something perfect, the apogee of progressive human history. Not a new plane, not salvation, an elevation to something heavenly beyond this world, but instead salvation by creating the perfect order right here, right now on earth. If we keep that dilemma, keep that choice in the backs of our minds, then it becomes possible to interpret the secular political events of the Cold War in reference to what exactly contributes to thinking through the coming of the end of human life on Earth. Because, for the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, the arrival of midnight, the arrival of the end, if you will, is not a good thing. That means an end to human society. It means progress negated or erased, not fulfilled. So a very, very clear distinction has to be drawn here that when we come back, especially, and this may be most controversially, I'd say a lot of not just politicians, but also scientists for this reason have even disputed the way the clock has been reset, maybe even manipulated in recent memory. Let's talk for a moment about the short story by American literary legend, Ray Bradbury, entitled Soft Rains, which I assigned you for today. Very short, only five pages and devastating. I am a small child at home, and this story always mortifies me when I reread it, this particular type of ending. Bradbury was only 30 years old when he published this short story. It was, in fact, one of his first major publications. It became part of what he brought together from serialized publications as the Martian Chronicles. Now, Bradbury is best known for his novel Fahrenheit 451, remade recently once again, the year 2018, as a major motion picture. Back in 1950, what Bradbury was trying to do was offer social commentary. There's no human players in the story he's telling. They're all dead, all vaporized. They've all been annihilated in a nuclear blast. Remember in those photos of Hiroshima that it is possible for buildings to survive a nuclear blast. And Bradbury crafts a story in which there is one house, one structure that has survived. And the house is eerily demarcated by this one wall which is entirely blackened, but retains the imprints on it of individual human beings, the family that once inhabited this house that was annihilated by nuclear blast, but whose forms were imprinted upon the wall as it was hit with that wave of energy. The small boy in the middle of the act of throwing a ball into the air, his sister getting ready to catch it, his mother gardening, a father mowing the lawn, all dead in the context of the action that has clearly played out. Soft Rains is clearly a story of both future utopia and dystopia. In other words, a combination of both the light and dark sides of progressive history. In the story, it's said to have been many days since the deaths of the house's human inhabitants. And the family dog shows up and dies very soon after being let into the house. Now, this house is fully automated. The idea being that science and technology have gotten humankind to this advanced consumer civilization, where your house is smart enough that it will make all of the conveniences of life available to you without any kind of reprogramming, any kind of constant maintenance. Tell you when your bills are due, pay them for you, provide your food for you, prepare everything for you, even read poetry to you. There's the poem that's read about the destruction of the world. It comes from, actually, the woman depicted in the lower right-hand corner of the slide here, American poet Sarah Teasdale, considered a brilliant and incredibly promising poet up until the moment when she killed herself in the early 1930s. And her suicide really spoke, I think, to Bradbury in many ways, and would have been part of the reason why he chose her poem to mark what had happened to the family and to the civilization that they represent in this story, a civilization that had really collapsed in on itself. This one house which survived, kind of frozen in time in a way that was almost absurd, producing toast and scrambling eggs that were only going straight into the garbage wiping away the dust that was going to be incinerated anyway, robotic mice going around cleaning a house that wasn't being sullied at all, up until the moment when the black rain, as it's called, the nuclear winter that has set in and has brought fire down from the skies. 
even in the context of these soft rains that Bradbury ironically terms as being the defining trope of the story, that ultimately burns the house down, that ultimately destroys everything except that one wall marking the silhouettes of the family that had died. And that wall maintains in a constant loop the echo of the date being given on which everything had been frozen. Bradbury gave the year 2026, and of course, I sincerely hope that he's wrong about that year, given that it's only three years from now. But it's a devastating and really ominous prophecy. Consider that the same technology and the same drive for secular scientific progress that drew humankind in Bradbury's story to this kind of consumerist paradise, where human beings had developed this great way of living that catered to all their material needs, also ended up digging the graves of humankind by providing the same technology that would annihilate them. Remember, Bradbury was writing at the very beginning of the Cold War, in 1950, just one year after the Soviet Union had developed its own atomic bomb technology, and Bradbury was responding to a generalized fear that was taking hold within the US, but also more globally, that maybe the two sides weren't so rational in this emerging Cold War, and any number of hair trigger points could set off the total nuclear annihilation of all humankind. Let me read to you two brief passages from Bradbury's story. First, 10 o'clock, the sun came out from behind the rain. The house stood alone in a city of rubble and ashes. This was the one house left standing. At night, the ruined city gave off a radioactive glow, which could be seen for miles." End quote. Next quotation. In the last instant under the fire avalanche, other choruses, oblivious, could be heard announcing the time cutting the lawn by remote control mower, or setting an umbrella frantically out and in, the slamming and opening front door, a thousand things happening, like a clock shop when each clock strikes the hour insanely before or after the other, a scene of maniac confusion, yet unity." End quote. The clock could well have referred here to the doomsday clock. The idea being that there was an underlying throbbing pulse of humanity that had been both destroyed and somehow survived in an echo chamber. It's a poetic accomplishment, this story, and a devastating prophecy in some sense. Prophecy in the sense also that we might consider revisiting Nostradamus. There is detail here, but we don't actually have the detailed prediction in terms of what would happen and when. We don't have an account, we don't have the empirically measured, scientifically theorized, rationally worked out equation of any kind. What we have is a broad view, broad strokes, and this paralyzing fear of the prospect of fulfillment of this prophecy. So what exactly would this mean? Is it an eschaton? Sure, it is. Is it a fulfillment of progressive history? Only in the most perverse and negative sense. If we are looking for an example of the kind of perverse fulfillments of the eschaton that came through not just intellectual and cultural trend lines produced by the global Cold War, but more generally, a global climate of political and material uncertainty with spiritual overtones, but totally cut away and totally disconnected from institutional or organized religion as such. You see in this movie that I've assigned to you for today, Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. From the year 1964, the famous production of Stanley Kubrick, well-known director also of A Clockwork Orange or 2001 A Space Odyssey. On the slide you see here, I am reproducing for you two critical quotations that I would like to discuss. First, from the general who starts it all. The film is a dark comedy about the beginning of global nuclear meltdown touched off by an American general who has decided that he is going to intentionally provoke a Soviet nuclear retaliation without orders from the American commander in chief. The rather absurdly named General Jack D. Ripper declares, I can no longer sit back and allow communist infiltration, communist indoctrination, communist subversion, and the international communist conspiracy to sap and purify all of our precious bodily fluids. Now, this is a parody Kubrick is making of the language of the era of Joseph McCarthy and his witch hunts against communism and U.S. culture and public life in the first half of the 1950s, over a decade before this movie was produced. It is also a point about eugenics and our author from yesterday, Vladimir Tismanyanu's discussion of heritable traits in the context of Bolshevik or Soviet power. 
But this movie is also a response to the Cuban Missile Crisis, which had played out only two years before the movie's release. Kennedy had managed to finagle the United States way out of the Cuban Missile Crisis without triggering a global nuclear conflagration. But the point that Kubrick was making is that at absolutely any moment, a figure like Ripper could have exercised control over such objects of devastating potential that really it was only a matter of time before the US or its Soviet counterparts brought about the end of human existence, even though the Cuban Missile Crisis had resolved itself peacefully. In a sense, with the creation of atomic weaponry, humankind had already ended itself. So Kubrick's apocalypse is both imminent with an A and imminent with an I, both being true of the coming total devastation. In 1964, the secular eschaton was already upon us. That was the message, the core idea of this Dr. Strangelove movie. The character named Dr. Strangelove in this movie offers a key bit of insight midway into the film. Again, this is supposed to be a figure emblematic of the many ex-Nazi German emigre scientists incorporated into the U.S. defense establishment in the Cold War effort to stave off a weapons triumph by the Soviet Union. Commenting on the development of what the U.S. weapons establishment was calling a doomsday machine, Strangelove invokes some of the very language we've been discussing in the context of the doomsday clock. Doomsday being two different things at once, a dream or fantasy, and something to be avoided at all costs. Strangelove declared in the movie, the whole point of the doomsday machine is lost. If you, talking to President Muffley, keep it a secret, why didn't you tell the world, eh? It's an interesting question, very interesting. We see the hotline between Moscow and Washington DC play out very awkwardly, taking a lot of time to be actually set into motion in this movie. Then we see nothing if not one miscommunication after another. With the story of Dr. Strangelove, the physicist's inability to weigh in and make any kind of scientific change, but really getting the American policy establishment geared up to repopulate the earth after nuclear catastrophe. Unwilling to stop that catastrophe, but instead starting to plan for a post-apocalyptic world. In other words, that there might, maybe, be some life after the end. It's an interesting thesis that we have yet to confront. But if we go back to the timeline of the doomsday clock, you look at how the farthest that this doomsday clock has shown humankind since the 1940s to be from collective suicide was 1991, the end of the Cold War. That was supposed to be it. That was supposed to be an end of human history. Not in the tragic sense, but in a way you'll see from a reading I'm assigning you for tomorrow by the legendary political thinker Francis Fukuyama about the supposed triumph of liberal democracy over the international communist ideology. That was supposed to have been a good ending. That was supposed to have been an enlightenment style, secular fulfillment of humankind's ability to craft its own apogee of progress, the apogee of rational self-organization, the self-ordering of earth. Instead, once that model was discredited, once the idea of having reached the pinnacle of human development was shown not to have been the end point and not to have been quite as perfect as everyone had hoped once the Cold War had ended, well, since that moment, we seem to be getting farther and farther away and instead closer and closer to doomsday or to a catastrophic eschatological ending. Now, perhaps we're at that point if we think in terms of the apocalypse narrative of atomic warfare, the atomic era, of thinking or trying to move towards something that was actually done in the 1970s, where the process of détente, French for relaxation of tensions, really yielded a major accomplishment. In 1975, the United States and the USSR led a broad coalition of countries signing the Helsinki Accords in the Finnish capital city. Notice this is the same year that Andrei Saharov won the Nobel Peace Prize. He still wasn't allowed out of the Soviet Union to receive it, despite the Helsinki process. The idea being that the USSR and the United States would relax tensions, would try to move away, pull back from that nuclear brink, from the brink of the end. And as such, what Saharov would say, turning back to the speech that his wife delivered on his behalf at the Nobel ceremony, is that progress in human history is possible within certain parameters. Perhaps, Progress is indeed possible if, 
culturally and intellectually, humankind can keep up and reinvent itself in secular terms, providing a kind of dignity that once had been suggested by the Judeo-Christian worldview, even if not really ever completely fulfilled. I'm quoting from Saharov now. Freedom of conscience, together with the other civic rights, provides the basis for scientific progress and constitutes a guarantee that scientific advances will not be used to despoil mankind, providing the basis for economic and social progress, which in turn is a political guarantee for the possibility of an effective defense of social rights." End quote. In other words, freedom of conscience has to go hand in hand with taking totalitarianism off the table, with moving beyond all-encompassing secular eschatologies that put an abstract goal, even if it's supposedly for the benefit of all humankind, ahead of the lives of individual human beings. All of that should be made impossible. No secular dream of perfection on earth should trump the lives of people really living and really working, trying to fulfill themselves now as individuals with human dignity. Now, clearly there's a balancing act to be struck there. And clearly the doomsday clock shows that humankind has a long ways to go if there is really to be any hope at all for achieving that balancing act. But I, for one, refuse to believe that Ray Bradbury's prophecy has to come, that it's an inevitability, that it is in fact an eschatological prophecy with no point of return. Let us hope for our own sakes, and certainly the sakes of the generations that might come after us, that human beings can actually pull back from the brink of atomic conflict and that there is, maybe, the possibility for a new Helsinki and a new way of trying to square the different elements raised by Saharov. That we might preserve the idea of progress, but without taking it so far as to lead to the annihilation of mankind that we saw in Bradbury's account. Thank you. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. If you're interested in hearing more history, check out Season 2 of the Presidential Recordings podcast. The second season focuses on taped conversations between President Richard Nixon on topics ranging from the Watergate scandal to his nominees for the Supreme Court. The Presidential Recordings podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts.